The city of Bristol straddles the River Avon in the southwest of England. Steeped in maritime history, it boasts an ancient port, now an exciting cultural hub of bars, restaurants and museums. Its university draws a diverse population of young people. Its many beautiful old buildings are converted into flats and apartments. It's a busy, vibrant place to live and visit. In October 2010, 25-year-old Joanna Yates had made it her home, moving into a flat in Carnegie Road in the suburb of Clifton with her boyfriend. Joanna was originally from Hampshire and had been privately educated at Embley Park near Romsey. She had a degree in landscape architecture as well as a postgraduate diploma in this area. Her boyfriend was an architect. They were a young professional couple with a bright future. They had first got a place together in 2009 in Bristol, so they weren't strangers to the city. The beautiful old building where they lived was owned by landlord Christopher Jeffries, and he lived there himself in one of the flats. On December the 17th, 2010, Joanna and her boyfriend had been moved in for a few short weeks. Joanna was facing her first weekend alone in the flat as her boyfriend was going to be away. It wasn't a prospect she was looking forward to, but she'd made plans to see friends and do Christmas shopping, as well as some baking in preparation for a party that they were going to be throwing. There was just over a week to go before their first Christmas together in their new home, and there was plenty to look forward to. December 17th, 2010 was a Friday, and Joanna spent the evening with friends at the Bristol Ram pub. It was located in the main part of the city and about a 30-minute walk from her home. Joanna wasn't out late. Leaving her friends at 8pm, she made her way back through the festive bustle of a Friday night in Bristol on the run-up to Christmas. She popped into a Waitrose supermarket 10 minutes later but didn't purchase anything. As she walked, she phoned her best friend and made plans to meet up on Christmas Eve. At 8.40pm, the last images of Joanna, picked up by CCTV, showed her buying a pizza and two small bottles of cider from a Tesco Express. The perfect ingredients for a quiet night in. Shortly after 9pm, a neighbour in a nearby property on Carnegie Road reported hearing two short screams. On Sunday, December 19th, Joanna's boyfriend returned to their flat, worried that his calls and texts to Joanna had gone unanswered. Worry must have given way to panic when he returned to an empty flat and on calling Joanna once more, heard her phone ringing from the pocket of her coat which hung in the flat. Also present were her keys and her purse and their pet cat didn't appear to have been fed. There were no obvious signs of a struggle or forced entry, and it was as if she had vanished into thin air. Joanna's boyfriend contacted the police as well as her parents to report her missing just after midnight. Joanna's movements were tracked via statements from her friends, CCTV and phone data. Joanna's boyfriend, along with Joanna's friends, set up a website and used social media to help look for her. There were a number of press conferences where appeals were made for her safe return. Police believed they were looking at an abduction and that Joanna may have known her attacker. The pizza that she'd purchased was not in the flat and neither was any packaging pertaining to it. After what can only have been an agonising week for Joanna's loved ones, the bleakest of Christmases dawned with the discovery of Joanna's frozen body on a roadside near to a quarry three miles from her home. It was Christmas Day and a couple walking their dog made the horrendous discovery, shattering everyone's hopes that by some miracle Joanna would be found alive. Operation Braid was set up by Avon and Somerset Constabulary. Made up of 80 detectives, it was one of the biggest operations in their history. Police received hundreds of calls to their incident room and they followed up every lead. They examined hundreds of hours of CCTV, sifted through 293 tonnes of rubbish from the area around Joanna's home 
and were especially interested in seeking the driver of a light-coloured 4x4 vehicle. Crime Stoppers offered a £10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. The Sun newspaper offered £50,000. Women in the area lived in fear and were warned not to walk alone. Joanna's father publicly expressed his belief that whoever had done this to his daughter would not voluntarily hand themselves in. His only hope was that police would catch the one responsible. The results of the post-mortem showed that Joanna had been strangled. There were no signs of S.A. The police noticed striking similarities with other unsolved cases, some stretching back to the 1970s. By January the 4th, a forensic psychologist specialising in criminal profiling joined the investigation and began narrowing down the potential suspects. It was revealed at this time that one of Joanna's socks were missing and had not been found. An advertising campaign was launched on Facebook and YouTube, receiving over 250,000 views in a day. On December 30th, Joanna Yates' landlord, Christopher Jeffries, who owned the building and occupied one of the flats there, was arrested on suspicion of Joanna's murder. His flat was examined for forensic evidence and a number of extensions were granted to hold him for questioning. He was detained for 96 hours before being bailed. The press made much of his arrest and his photograph was on the front page across the country. His odd looks and his eccentric nature made him a target of a media feeding frenzy. Details of his life that had no place being released were maligning his image and perpetuating a trial by tabloid that had him convicted of Joanna Yates's murder by the court of public opinion. He was released on bail but nevertheless suffered constant vilification by the press. A reconstruction of Joanna's movements were filmed in Bristol with a view to them airing on Crime Watch. The snowy conditions of the time in question were reproduced using film industry effects. The filming took place on January the 18th. News coverage of the event prompted 300 new calls to the police. On the morning of January the 20th, another residence of the flats in Joanna Yates's building was arrested. 32-year-old architectural engineer Vincent Tabak, who lived with his girlfriend in the flat next door to Joanna. Vincent Tabak had lived in the building since May 2009. He'd never been a friend of Joanna's or her boyfriend's and he doesn't appear to have ever met her or spoken to her in the few weeks that she was his neighbour. He had been spoken to first by police only four hours after Joanna's boyfriend had reported her missing. Tabak provided no information, saying he'd heard nothing at all on that night. On December 23rd, a routine check had been made of his flat to check whether Joanna was there. Tabak had later joked to his friends that police must have thought he'd hidden her in a drawer. Tabak and his girlfriend spent Christmas in Cambridge with her family. He was contacted by phone on Christmas Eve and asked about his movements on the 17th. He said he'd been in all evening, but he went out in the early hours to pick his girlfriend up from a work party. He said his new neighbours were strangers to him. On December the 28th, three days after Joanna's body was found, Tabak and his girlfriend were on their way to the Netherlands to visit his family for the new year. It was from his parents' home in the Netherlands that Tabak watched the arrest of his landlord, Christopher Jeffries, on TV. This was the start of Tabak's undoing and his first big mistake. After seeing the news, Tabak began to inject himself into the investigation, calling the police incident room to tell them that he had seen his landlord out and about in his car on the night Joanna disappeared. It seems Tabak saw this as a perfect opportunity to heap further suspicion on Christopher Jeffries and as a way of diverting any attention from himself. 
The police took his call seriously and sent an officer to the Netherlands to speak to him in person. His interview lasted six hours and police began to be suspicious of his behaviour. He seemed overly interested in the forensic examinations, as well as providing a different version of his movements on the night of the 17th. He also volunteered that it was possible that he had been in the hallway of Joanna's flat when chatting to Christopher Jeffries before Joanna's disappearance. It was following this conversation with police that requests were made for Tabak's DNA and fingerprints to be tested as a process of elimination. On January the 20th, three weeks later, he was arrested following DNA linking him to the body of Joanna Yates. Following his arrest, the planned airing of the Crime Watch reconstruction was shelved. Christopher Jeffries was no longer held on suspicion of having any involvement. He was later awarded an undisclosed sum in compensation. The Levinson inquiry requested by David Cameron found the tabloid press's behaviour to be a black mark on journalism and something that could not be allowed to happen again. The case against Tabak went to trial on the 4th of October 2011 at Bristol Crown Court. Tabak pleaded guilty to manslaughter, denying murder. He claimed Joanna's death was unintentional, following him being invited into her flat by Joanna. Tabak's version of events was not believed, and on October the 28th he was found guilty of Joanna's murder and sentenced to life with a minimum of 20 years. Only Tabak truly knows the real course of events and the motives behind what he did. It is believed he will never reveal the true details of what he did and why. The judge believed there was a sexual element to the killing, despite Tabak saying this wasn't the case. Details of the removal, storage and dumping of Joanna's body have also not been clearly explained. Tabak claims poor recall of events, not even knowing how Joanna sustained the 43 injuries to her body. He also stated he couldn't remember how she'd been in her last moments, or even whether she'd been frightened. His callous disregard for his actions was noted in how after he had placed Joanna in the boot of his car, he went shopping for beer and crisps and sent texts to his girlfriend telling her he was bored. It seems he thought he was too clever for police and that setting up his already victimised landlord would keep him above suspicion. He was wrong. So I'm standing outside now. Um, beautiful old building. Um, split up into flats, I imagine still. Um, and it was here that uh, Joanna moved into a flat in this property in October of 2010. Um, Tarbuck would been living here, I think, for about a year and a half prior. Um, <clears throat> Joanna and her boyfriend had only been here for about six weeks um, and her boyfriend was away for the weekend and she was spending the first weekend there by herself. We know that she was, wasn't really looking forward to it, that she'd been out with friends that evening. Uh, she made her way back here after stopping off to buy pizza, a couple of bottles of cider, small bottles, you know, to have an evening in. And she'd phoned her best friend um, to make arrangements to go out on Christmas Eve. So they know all this. So police think that um, he literally burst, I don't know whether he knocked on the door and she answered it and he pushed his way in. Um, but he literally killed her within a couple of minutes of her um, coming back to the flat. Um, there was much made of the fact that the pizza that she bought was missing. 
the packaging wasn't there but yeah this is the this is the place I mean it's just a, a, a beautiful beautiful street um, you know the houses are really old with real character you know and to think she'd only been here a few weeks literally two months and uh, you know what plans she had for the future how exciting it must have been you know her and her boyfriend making plans getting a place together in this lovely quiet lane and to think what happened to her so quickly after moving in it makes you think you know he'd been here Talbot had been here a year over a year and he just spot her as she moved in you know took an opportunity when he knew she was alone I mean they found they found disturbing stuff on his computer I found violent pornography a lot of it around strangulation they also found some decent images of children so his version of events was that Joanna had made a flirty comment um, <laughs> And that he had tried to kiss her and uh, you know it took her by surprise and he accidentally strangled her I mean okay <laughs> not quite sure how you accidentally strangle somebody but there you go hardly surprising it didn't take the jury more than two days to find him guilty of murder yeah it's a uh, this is the street this is the neighborhood where she lived very briefly before her life was taken so cruelly just before Christmas 2010 so imagine if you will Christmas morning and this area is covered in snow and you're walking your dog enjoying a Christmas day walk along this path here now this is a busy area you know I've been waiting about 20 minutes just for it to be a bit quiet so I can film this is a place that's used a lot by local people and I imagine it was quite beautiful that morning. You know, frosty, cold, a blanket of snow. You know, you couldn't ask for a more Christmassy start to your day, could you? Well, that wasn't the case for this couple who walked along this path here. So with their dog, they walked along here. And at the end of this path, there's a gate that leads on to Longwood Road and it's just opposite a quarry and it was over the road from here that Joanna's body was found now in the photographs that you can see from the time there was a wall along here which now 13 years later is fenced off and there's lots of lots of bushes and hedges so you can't see that wall now Police think that Tabak transported Joanna's body in a hold all 
bag. And that perhaps, you know, his intention was to place her over the wall. But he couldn't, couldn't lift her. It was too heavy. So what he did, and I'm going to show you in a minute when people have gone, what he did was actually just leave her body at the side of the road. Um, covered her in leaves and left her there which seems like uh, I'm not entirely sure how long she was there for or how she wasn't discovered sooner if he if he left the body here soon after he killed her I have no idea how she wasn't discovered for almost a week but am I I'm going to have a little bit of a read in and see, but I can't, I don't think he kept her anywhere. I think he, he, he disposed of her almost straight away. Now there's the quarry just there. I think that's where he was intending to go. Just there where those cars are on the side of the road there by those cars is where her body was found where those people are so they crossed this road here and it was along here I think just past this car that her body was found Again, if you look through there, you can see there was a wall. Um, I don't think this green fence was here. I'll check the photographs again. I don't think it was. But in the photographs at the time, you can just see a wall and you can see flowers. literally just a few hundred yards from the quarry entrance opposite a popular nature spot where people ride their bikes go for walks and this is where she lay um, it was said that um, her body was frozen but there wasn't any immediate obvious injuries. So police thought she'd actually frozen to death. Um, but later, you know, the post-mortem revealed that she had been strangled. She did have significant injuries to show that she put up a fight. She really, really put up a fight. And, uh, Christmas that she was looking forward to, her first Christmas in her new home with her boyfriend. That was never to be, she never had that, he never had that. Um, her parents, you can only imagine the anguish forevermore. They'll never have another Christmas again. So that's the spot. She's buried in uh, Hampshire, which is where she grew up. Joanna's boyfriend started a charity website in her name to raise money for missing people. Her friends and family planted a memorial garden at the Sir Harold Hillier Gardens in Romsey, 
where she'd worked as a student. There were other plans for memorial gardens in keeping with Joanna's passion for landscape architecture. The memory of Joanna Yates will long outlive that of the man who ended her life. Rest in peace, Joanna Yates.